Good morning. Good morning. That was just in case. Um, please join me in the call to worship. Please read the yellow print on the screen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside all still waters. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And now please read with me the opening prayer. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to be the chosen one who would save us from our errors and rebellion. With your Son, you have anointed us in the love and power of the Holy Spirit. Let your mercy flow over us so that your justice might be like rolling waters in our world. Amen. Please pray with me to receive God's word. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. What are we going to do? So, she asked if I was out today. So, you know where they are? They are camping with the family. So, what do you think Graham and Reed are doing about right now, maybe? What do they like to do best? Uh, football? I don't know about football. They're kind of by a lake. What else do they think? Or a river? Or a Ooh, it's kind of chilly. But they might. But you know what they love to do? They like to go and catch those fish. Right? That's one of their favorite things to do. So what is one of your favorite things to do or something you, um, a toy or whatever? What, if, what do you like? Probably going to the pool. Oh, yeah, I see. And going swimming. Oh, oh I see. Okay. Brayden, how about you? Um, bike riding. Oh, I see. So what did uh, what did you hear me say when you were telling me this? What did I keep saying? I see. Could I really see you on a dirt bike? Mm, no. Nope. And I couldn't see you in the swimming pool or outside. But what I could do is understand. So that's another word for see. Oh, I see. I have an idea. I see. So we're going to talk when you go upstairs, and Miss um, Jess is going to do stories with you upstairs. So this story that we're going to talk about downstairs and you upstairs comes from the New Testament in the book of John, chapter 9, 1 through 14. And it's a story about Jesus walking on the road, and he sees a man who is blind. What does blind mean? He can't see. He can't see. His eyes are not working. He cannot see. And you know what Jesus does? He spits on his hand, picks up some dust, rubs it together and makes mud, and puts it on the guy's eye. Oh, man. Have you ever seen a doctor do that? Have you ever known where a doctor has healed somebody who's blind that can't see? No. Doctors can give us glasses, 
but they can't make our eyes work just like that. So he told this man to go to the lake and wash his face. And you know what happened? He washed the mud off and he could see. Oh, man, that's awesome. I know. <laughs> I think Jesus had some magic. He had some power. And that power came from God. So he could do m magic things. We call them miracles. Okay? But some of the other people that were around Jesus weren't too sure they liked him doing that, especially because it was Sunday. And you're not supposed to work on Sundays. And he thought that by Jesus fixing the guy's eyes, he was working. So the people that can see, like I can see things, but I can't always understand. And that's what happened in this story. Jesus helped somebody who could see with his eyes, and other people around were very, very happy that that happened because they could now see this man, and he could see again. But the other people that really were kind of angry at Jesus said he shouldn't have done that. And so they were the ones that couldn't see. They couldn't understand. So there's two ways of thinking about it. When you say, I see with my eyes, or I see and I understand. So that's what you guys are going to be talking about this next Sunday. And since I'm not going upstairs, don't get a head start now. <laughs> um, I want to say a prayer with you right now. And this is a repeat after me prayer, okay? So I'm going to say something, and then you say the same thing. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus, who teaches us how to see you better, so that others can also see you better. Thank you. Amen. 1 through 7, 13 through 17, and 34 through 41. This is on page 78 in the Pew Bible. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he has said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which meant sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day, and Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I come into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. 
Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Our third scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of God for the people of God. Author of life, we thank you for your word. And we ask your spirit to be with us this morning to transform us in heart, mind, and soul. Amen. One of my Lenten devotions has been making time each day so that I can spend half an hour reading Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. If you're unfamiliar with this work, it's a massive compendium of theological questions and answers that has been used as one of the bedrocks of theological training across the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant worlds. And the reason I bring this up is because St. Thomas provides us with a very useful definition of sin by saying that sin is falling short of a perfect action. God is perfect. We are instructed by Christ to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It's a particular emphasis on pursuing this perfection through sanctification that made our Methodist movement distinct within the family of faith, and yet it is the falling short of perfection that necessitates God's grace on our behalf. So we'll keep in mind this falling short of perfection as we recap what has been going on in the sweeping biblical narrative as we hurtle through time once again closer and closer to Holy Week. Our story began with the ancestral figures that we know as Adam and Eve who are placed in a garden with limitless potential and nearly limitless opportunities. But they fell short of a perfect action when, when they, they took, took the, the one, one thing, thing forbidden, forbidden to them. them. And so they and their descendants ended up in the wilderness. And then there was a lot of humanity falling short until we got to Abraham, 
who made covenant with God so that God promised not to abandon the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no matter how many times they were going to fall short in the future. And this was a fortunate promise for the people of Israel because Jacob's sons fall short of perfection an awful lot, but especially when they sell their brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And then Joseph falls short of perfection when he fails to reform the slave system that had oppressed him, causing all of Israel to be brought into oppression. But God wipes the slate clean again by lifting up Moses, the liberator and the lawgiver, to lead the people into freedom and joyful obedience. But the people fall short time and time again. So God lets a whole generation of Israelites pass in the wilderness before bringing the people back to their promise. So many times under Moses' leadership that not even Moses gets to enter the promised land. So Joshua, at least according to the biblical account, he leads the people in a conquest of Canaan. And for a while, the people live in peace under a system of loose confederation. The 12 tribes plus the Levites are all just kind of minding their own business and doing their own thing unless an existential threat like foreign invasion occurs. In the case of something like that, then the people unite under the leadership of the judges. And for a while, this works out well for the Israelites. But you can probably guess what happens next. They fall short of perfection. And let me pause for just a second here because I'm going to apologize right now for the fact that I might be about to ruin some Sunday school stories for you. Near the end of the book of Judges, we're introduced to the final judge of that narrative, Samson. Now, if you heard about Samson in Sunday school, you almost certainly got a sanitized version of Samson that probably made him seem borderline heroic, if not outright heroic. Probably something along the lines of, God gave Samson super strength, but one day the wicked Delilah tricked him and she cut off his hair, which was the source of his power, so that he could be captured by the Philistines. And as Samson was in captivity, his hair eventually grew long again, his strength returned, and he brought down the entire building on himself and his captors. Now admittedly, those are all elements of the story of Samson, but here's the part that we miss out on if we try to make it kid-friendly. Samson was a bad person. Samson was a child of miraculous conception. His mother had been barren, and in return for the gift of a son, she had to promise the Lord that her son would take religious vows so that God could use him to save the Israelites from the Philistines. But that's not how Samson's life goes. Samson is a wild, brutish man. He chases after women, he provokes fights, he drinks, he breaks his promises, and for 20 years, this is the guy that's calling the shots. It is a disaster. Samson falls short in almost every way possible, and people suffer as a result. This is a story that is meant to convince us of the need for a king instead of these wild, unpredictable judges. Now, the book of Samuel gives us a different judge at the end of the period of Judges. The final judge is, in fact, Samuel, who also serves as a prophet. And again, in this version of events, we're meant to see how the system of Judges is too prone to people falling short of perfection. Samuel also was brought into the world by a miraculous conception, but he has been a good and a just judge for the people. It's his sons that fall short. In his old age, Samuel tries to step back from leadership, entrusting the responsibility to his sons, but they immediately prove themselves unfit for the job by taking bribes and perverting justice. So the people cry out for a king. They want, they want a new system, a system like all the other nations around them have, out with the judges and in with the kings. 
So Samuel takes their request to the Lord, and God responds that it isn't Samuel or the judges that the people have rejected. They've actually rejected God's authority. Nevertheless, God says, if you want kings, then set up kings for yourselves. But know that along with your kings, you're going to get everything else that comes with them. The kings are going to take your wealth. They'll take your sons to die in foreign lands. They'll take your daughters into their service and into their bedchambers. They'll take your land, your livestock, your produce, your very freedom. But hey, if you can live with all of that, then go ahead and get yourself a king. So what do the people do when they hear this warning? Well, they get themselves a king. And who is that king? Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. He seems like the perfect kind of guy to be a king. He's tall. He's handsome. He's from a wealthy family, from a tribe of brave warriors. If you want a king to have a good resume, Saul is the guy who has it. And so God tells Samuel, hey, tomorrow I'm going to send a Benjamite your way and you're going to anoint him to be the ruler of my people who will save them from the Philistines. Because despite Saul's resume, Saul proves to be just as wild and brutish as Samson. And here is finally where we're getting to the point of today's sermon. Saul is meant to be the anointed one, or we could say the christened one. Or if we're reading the story in Greek, we would say that or in Hebrew, the Messiah. Saul is the chosen one of God who will save his people, except, whoops, Saul is too brash, too violent, too wild, too quick to break his promises to both man and God. So the Lord goes back to Samuel and says, hey, sorry that uh, Saul didn't work out. I've, I've got someone else in mind. You're going to go find Jesse of the tribe of Judah. He's got a bunch of sons. You just have to have them come before you, and when I see the right one, I'll let you know. So Jesse gets his sons and parades them before Samuel, and then son after son after son gets passed by. And eventually, it seems like Samuel has rejected everyone, except there's still a son out in the field with the sheep, the youngest son named David. Yes, that, that is the son that God wants. And as a firstborn son, I hate to say it, but God rarely wants anything to do with firstborn sons. He's a fan of the leastborn, the people with the least privilege or the least rank. And now, having found the son that God wants, the people have another anointed one, another Christ, another Messiah, another one chosen by God to save the people of God. And you know what? For a while, it seems like things are going to work out with David. He is a man after God's own heart. Unfortunately, however, the man after God's own heart is just a man. By the end of David's life, he too has fallen short in just about every way that he could. He has sent the sons of Israel off to die in needless wars. He has stolen the daughters of Israel for his own comfort. He has robbed and pillaged his own people. Far from saving the people of Israel, David has brought suffering to many and has set, people on the road, set the people on the road to ruin. And I'm not just harping on David for the sake of ruining one of the heroes of faith that we learn about when we're kids. If you remember last week, I talked about how tempting it is to whitewash or valorize the sins of our ancestors. We know that David is supposed to be a good guy because of how his story starts. And so we want that to be true of his whole life. But if we didn't know ahead of time, if we weren't told, hey, David is supposed to be a good guy, and we only read his story after he becomes the king, we'd have a hard time telling him from Pharaoh or from Herod. We are complex beings, and the people of Scripture are just as complex and flawed as us. David's story, the story of the kings as a whole, 
is a tragedy. So if there's something to take away this morning about your own faith, then let it be the knowledge that even the most noble and well-intentioned of us is prone to being human. We will all, at some point, fall short. And maybe that sounds incredibly obvious to you, but it still needs to be said because even if we know that everyone will fall short, we can still find it incredibly hard to forgive those shortcomings in ourselves and in others. We will all fall short of perfection, but it's what we do after the falling short that makes a difference. Will we repent? That is to say, will we turn back towards God, or will we double down on our falling and drive ourselves further into sin? This is exactly the reason that I've restored the prayer of confession and pardon to our weekly worship. The church needs to know how to turn back to God. We need to know that it's okay to seek forgiveness and grace without a sense of shame or fear. Without confession, how could we ever experience reconciliation? And without reconciliation, how could we ever know true peace? The other point that I want to make sure that you're all seeing this morning is how this is all leading us to Jerusalem during the final week of Jesus' ministry. Because if we're going to follow Jesus, then we need to know who Jesus actually is. We need to know how he fits into God's salvation history. So I want to draw us to a close this morning by making sure that we're seeing the scope of the whole narrative. Adam and Eve fall short of perfection and bring sin into the world. Moses, the liberator and the lawgiver, falls short in leading the people to the freedom of joyful obedience. David is the, the king, the savior, the Christ. But his kingship is tyrannical. His salvation is found at the end of a sword and his anointing is ultimately tragic. All of the hopes and the unfulfilled promises of these chosen people get wrapped up in the idea of who the Messiah or the Christ will be and what they will do. There's going to have to be a change because people, people keep falling short. God is going to have to do something different to bring about salvation, to restore the justice and the mercy of the law, and to establish the kingdom of God. And in just a couple of weeks, we will see how this all comes together as we walk through the gates of Jerusalem with Jesus, who actually is the Anointed One. Amen. Please pray with me. God, we give you thanks that even though you know we're going to fall short, you give us the freedom to do so anyways. We throw ourselves upon your mercy and your grace to lift us up when we fall, to strengthen us to try again, and to guide our path upon your straight and narrow way. Amen. And now would you please stand once again as you're able so that we can join together in affirming our faith in the God who picks us up when we fall by reciting together the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, as I was saying, we rely entirely upon the grace of God in our lives, and one of the ways that we get to ask for that grace is by joining together in prayer every Sunday morning. So as I invite you to send your prayer requests forward, I'll also invite you to join in a moment of silent prayer. Lord, as we prepare for the changing of the seasons, we look forward to the ways that new life will spring forth. We look toward the blooming of flowers, the budding of trees, and the rebirth of your holy church. With the coming of the spring, O oh Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to pour forth life and love on all who need it. And so, Lord, this morning, we join with Mary as she prays for positive results to come from a disability determination and for her son's mental health. We join with Allison and Jerry as they pray for Jerry's heart procedure this Thursday and for their grandson Nicholas as he deals with life changes. We join with Sandy as she continues to pray and we continue to pray for the Ukrainian people who don't deserve this war that has been forced upon them. And we join with Kevin in praying for the family of his cousin, Cole Posse, who died in a tragic car accident Thursday, Thursday and left behind a wife and two young children. Lord, for all those who are grieving, for those who are sick, for those who are just struggling with life, Lord, we ask you to send your peace and your love upon them, to send your grace, your, your power, and your presence into their lives so that we might all be reminded of the vision that you have for your kingdom, a vision of peace and love and happiness. Amen.
And now, as people who fall short on occasion, let us join together in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now as we come to our time of offering, a time to offer ourselves and our gifts, we have a short video to play for you again this morning. Every day, in places all around the world, disaster strikes. Families struggle. Homes and livelihoods are destroyed. People don't know where to turn. Hope is almost lost. And then, by the grace of God and through the support of people like you, UMCOR provides hope and healing to communities devastated by disasters. Part of the General Board of Global Ministries, UMCOR is a humanitarian relief arm of the United Methodist Church. Working in the U.S. and in countries around the world, UMCOR offers help when natural or man-made disasters overwhelm a local community's ability to respond and seeks to improve the well-being of displaced peoples, migrants, and refugees. In the U.S., UMCOR partners with United Methodist Annual Conferences, working with disaster response coordinators, disaster response ministries, and early response teams to provide support for relief and recovery efforts. By working together with U.S. conferences, UMCOR's connectional approach helps communities recover faster and make survivors' lives whole again. UMCOR also responds to international disasters, providing a range of relief and recovery support through local Methodist churches and trusted partners, as well as ecumenical and non-governmental organizations. UMCOR's efforts to help communities become more self-sufficient and better prepared for future disasters include care for the environment and sustainable agriculture. Every day around the world, UMCOR connects United Methodist Churches to God's mission by helping people who are suffering. As followers of Christ, we are called to protect the vulnerable, support the weak, and comfort those who mourn. To learn more or to give to UMCOR, visit umcor.org. So today is UMCOR Sunday. That means churches all across the globe in our denomination are taking up an offering today so that we can tell people, hey, when you give to UMCOR, 100% of your giving is actually going to go to the people in need um, because all of the overhead costs get covered in this UMCOR Sunday offering. So after church today, when we go downstairs for our potluck, make sure you put a little something in the baskets so that we can chip in and contribute to the good work that they do around the world. I know just last year, this church gave money through UMCOR to Ukraine. Um, they have helped in the United States with hurricane relief. They've helped in our own state with floods in the last few years. Um, there was that failure of a dam over near Bay City um, UMCOR helped with that. So UMCOR often is one of the first people on the ground and one of the last people to leave in helping to deal with these disasters. So the other couple things that I want to mention to you before we receive our offering this morning, you may have noticed there is now a recycling bin out in our lobby. Maria was kind enough to provide that for us. So when you leave today, if you're not taking your bulletin home with you, we can actually recycle them now instead of 
having to throw them out. So just want to make you aware that that is out there. And then I also want to draw your attention to our Holy Week offerings because Holy Week is coming a lot faster than I think it is. It's only a couple of weeks away at this point. Um, so Holy Week begins Palm Sunday. That's two Sundays from today. And then that week on Thursday, for Monday Thursday, we will gather at 7 p.m. Uh, up in the middle school room and we'll have a little bit of, I'm calling it a love feast, it's not quite, we're going to read some scriptures together, we're going to share some stories about our faith, um, and so we're going we're gonna to experience a little bit of an upper room experience for ourselves. And then on Good Friday, instead of a traditional Good Friday service, we're going to have um, a self-guided sensory prayer experience, so throughout the church there are going to be stations set up for you to experience different kinds of prayer as you walk through the final moments of Jesus' uh, life on the cross. And then Saturday, we're having a 12-hour prayer vigil, and so we're asking if you could sign up for half-hour prayer slots. There's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby, and if you're thinking to yourself, well, I couldn't possibly pray for a whole half hour, come to Good Friday. You will learn some different ways of praying, and that will help you for the prayer vigil on Saturday. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, we will have our service at 10 a.m., and uh, ASP is going to be providing us with a breakfast beforehand starting at 9. So Easter Sunday, make sure you show up a little bit early um, so you can have breakfast and then celebrate the resurrection with us. I think that's everything that I need to let you know about this morning.